is the uh, latest book that I've written is um, actually has two different parts to it. It's about the uh, concept of the adaptive landscape and it uh, basically demonstrates to people how the adaptive landscape concept can put into actual analytical practice because most people are uh, heretofore considered most of a nice abstract concept but you can't really use it to analyze evolution and I show basically that that's not true that you in fact can do that. Uh, the second half of the book uh, sort of continues on that and it takes on uh, uh, basically a demonstration of the uh, sort of a spatial approach to the whole concepts of natural selection, of evolutionary constraint, and also of evolutionary development, which is a popular field these days called Evo Devo. And all three of those rather difficult concepts can also be taken basically in, a, in an adaptive landscape sort of approach uh, uh, as a spatial representation, which is much simpler than many of the mathematical treatments that we've had previously. People have known about the adaptive landscape concept for quite a while. It goes all the way back to the 1930s with the great American geneticist Sewell Wright. Uh, and even though the concept's been around for, for you know, almost a hundred years now, or he's pushing that, uh, most people still consider it to be of heuristic value only, that you can't really use the concept to analyze evolution. And uh, I'd show basically that this is not true because there's a whole new discipline of science that uh, in evolutionary paleobiology uh, that we call theoretical morphology. And in the process of theoretical morphology, what you do is you analyze not only the forms of life that life has evolved, but also we look at the evolution of, of life that has not. With computer simulations, basically, we create forms of life that have never existed in the evolution of life on the planet Earth. And uh, we ask basically the question, why not? The standard evolutionary treatment is to, to find something that exists and say, okay, why did this, this form of plant or animal e evolve? But what we do in theoretical morphology is a lot of times we create forms that don't exist at all and say, why not? Why has evolution not produced a form of a plant like this or a form of an animal like this? And it's particularly these concepts of theoretical morphology that we can actually create spaces that contain both the spectrum basically of uh, animal life and plant life that exists, but also that does not exist. And once you have that continuum, the whole spectrum of not only what exists, but also what does not exist, then you can actually start uh, using that as a uh, spatial framework within which to create adaptive landscapes. If you think of a regular landscape, you have hills and valleys and flat plains. In an adaptive landscape, you have uh, mountainous peaks that basically represent high adaptation. And then uh, organisms which are halfway down the slope or so have intermediate adaptation and the things out on the flat plains have zero adaptation. Uh, and, and with a theoretical morphous space, we can actually create those types of surfaces with computer simulations. And then actually analyze organisms to see where they are, are they the tops of the peak or on the sides of the peak. And we can actually then create organisms that are out on the flat plains that have zero at adaptive value entirely. And this is what the book uh, demonstrates to the reader that we can do. Uh, the second thing is that uh, there's a great deal of confusion sort of the present time also with the concepts of uh, evolutionary constraint and evolutionary development. Uh, there are very interesting ideas, basically the idea is that evolution cannot do everything in essence. You, the process of evolution is channeled into certain directions uh, or may not be and that's the, the debate that we're um, engaged in in evolutionary paleobiology. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to handle, it's a very interesting concept but I demonstrated in this book that you can actually treat that also analytically in a theoretical morphospace space concept in the sense that we can actually uh, take a spatial presentation as to what regions of the theoretical morphospace space are available to organisms, uh, which regions are not, and therefore what regions they are constrained to be in, and in terms of future evolution, which directions they might be able to take uh, relative to those that they cannot. Uh, and this allows us to explain some really interesting phenomena that we see in the evolution of life, such as convergent evolution, where we have animals and plants that repeatedly over and over and over again evolve the same type of morphology. And so why is it why that the organisms are doing this? And we can show basically in a theoretical morphospace concept that in essence they're repeatedly invading a particular adaptive peak from different directions across the landscape. I and uh, some people that I'm working with also in uh, Earth and Planetary Sciences and other departments in the, uh, uh, the university as well, uh, I'm thinking uh, more straightforward analytic look at something I mentioned before that in context with evolutionary constraint, and that is convergent evolution. There's a lot of interest in the convergent evolution of life, 
but uh, no one has taken this type of a rigorous approach to it where we can quantitatively look at the evolution of life within an adaptive landscape or a theoretical morphous space. So um, in essence, my next project or things I'm working on right now um, is um, taking many of the ideas that are given in conceptual form in the book and actually using them to analyze the uh, phenomenon of convergent evolution in animals and plants.